Hey, how's it going everybody? Welcome back to the Kyle Chips 2K Legacy Mode series here on the channel, featuring the legendary Coach Carter in his third season of his first coaching position at the college level, UT Martin. The UTM Skyhawks are seeking their first ever Ohio Valley Conference title and first NCAA tournament appearance in program history, and they can achieve both of those milestones with just one more win against the 16 win, 14 loss Tennessee Tech Golden Eagles. The Skyhawks have had a crazy postseason so far, narrowly escaping the 8th seeded SEMU Red Hawks in a shootout, then followed with a dominant second half performance against Moorhead State in the semifinals. A true battle of underdogs today, as UT Martin sits at 23-8, already breaking their school record for wins in a season, their highest tally was 22 back in 2009. Meanwhile, Tennessee Tech with an upset win over UTM would secure the school's first trip to the big dance since 1964. The six-seeded TTU Golden Eagles are led by veteran point guard Bishop Walker who is a very rugged on-ball defender with no real weaknesses to his game. And if there was a six man of the year award in the OVC, three-point specialist Calvin Hoffman would be the frontrunner as he joins Walker as the only two Eagles above 10 points per game. The Eagles are very versatile on offense. TJ Cowens and Tyrese Clawson, two explosive slashes and physical defenders, they start at the wing spots. We've gone to war against two out of the best three offenses in the OVC at Moorhead State and SCMU this postseason, but we'll see if we can shift gears a bit. We cannot have the same game plan in this matchup compared to the first two rounds because TTU is third in least points allowed across the conference and number one in team rebounding at almost 32 a game. And that's big thanks to freshman center Cordell Crosby and upperclassman Jamarco Webster, who create one of the best defensive front courts across the entire Ohio Valley. But Webster, Starting at the 4, he's going to be a little dinged up today, so that is in our favor. This championship has been 23 episodes and 3 seasons in the making. Can Coach Carter lead his troops to the first ever conference title and NCAA tournament appearance in school history? Let's head down to the Thompson Bowling Arena, where Vern Lundquist and Bill Rafferty have the introduction for me. This is Vern Lundquist with Bill Raftery and Tracy Wilson. Give us your take, Bill. The story here is the matchup at off guard. Saunders is a wonderfully talented shooting guard. He's a tremendous threat thanks to the deft shooting touch of his. Russell is an excellent shooting guard in his own right. He's well built and solid for a two guard and will use his size to push around his defender. Both of them are great competitors. It should be a compelling game to watch. Tennessee Martin Skyhawks have the first possession. Winners out of 12 out of the last 13. They faced the Golden Eagles twice this season. Both games decided by less than 10 points. 1-1 one one against the Golden Eagles as Lawton slips inside. Good pass from Saunders, but he's unsuccessful on the layup. Here comes Cowens on the other end, and he is sent back by Faye. It's going to be very hard for UTM to score in the paint, but right as I say that, here comes Saunders. Puts on the baby cross, and he finishes giving us the early advantage here in the title game. Of course, UTM likes to play this defense 94 feet with this trap. They're number one in the conference in steals per game, but on the other end, here comes the sure-handed Bishop Walker, the lone senior in the starting five for the Golden Eagles. He gets them on the board. Saunders and Bishop Walker with a shot of peace, the leading scores for each side. They're the ones that put up the first points in this game as Lawton misfires, but Faye on the second effort, he gives easily a second chance to fire. That one is off the back rim and Cordell Crosby, the leading rebounder for Tennessee Tech with the outlet pass up to Bishop Walker who makes his second basket in as many minutes. This Tennessee Tech squad full of athletes, we're going to have to show off some hustle if we're going to stop those open floor opportunities here in this game. Down a basket, Isaac gets a screen, fires for the third time today, and he misses for the third straight time as well, but Lawton on the glass. Nice up and under move, kiss off the window, and now Lawton has his first basket. Now the thing's back up at four. The second year, Lawton, he's been a little quiet down the stretch here in the season, but he's still averaging six points a game, which is double from his freshman year. 
Now here comes Tyrese Claus receiving a screen from Webster and he strokes it, giving Tech an early three-point advantage. And Clawson, a sophomore from Cincinnati, Ohio, he makes 35% of his three-pointers, averaging 7.5 points on the year. 9-6, Tech has the advantage. Saunders swings it inside to Fry as we continue to have some trouble finding any separation in this 2-3 zone as Webster sends back yet another one. Walker down to the short corner for Cowens who knocks it down and so far so good for Tennessee Tech. 11-6 as Cowens, this junior from Port St. Lucie, Florida, averaging 9 on the year he has his first basket. 11-8 after two free throws from Christopher Fay. Good screen, however, on the other end for Bishop Walker. Dwight Easley was completely lost as he was blindsided by that screen. And Bishop Walker with 9, he's outscoring UT Martin as now Easley gives it back. Bishop Walker with a nice pass to Cowens, there's his second basket. And Walker, a menace on defense, averaging 1.5 steals on the year, one of the best defenders in the conference. Tennessee Tech shocking the Skyhawks so far and now Blair Renfro with some other bench guys check in a platoon swap he turns it over but right back to UT Martin Skillfield picks it up Hamilton the top assister on the team he tries to set up Renfro who is also denied Clawson takes it away and he slips a pass into Luther Brooks the backup point guard and Tech 19-8 run to begin this game and a subsequent timeout for coach Carter we're halfway through the first half, only 8 points however to show for it for UTM as now Diggs tries to pull from 15 feet, nice move, no good, but Schofield, he recovers, and Blair Renfro, he is wide, wide open, and that's why we call Renfro the lone senior on this team, the Kyle Korver of UTM, he just comes in and kills zones with his potent 3 point shooting, now Hamilton with a little mismatch, he's got Cordell Crosby on him, he takes him with the cross and finishes over the big fella. With the emergence of Diggs, we can't forget just how solid Pierre Hamilton has been this year. Leading the team in assists per game with 3.5, he also chips in 4 points, and the Juco transfer in his first year at the D1 level has been extremely solid. Jamarco Webster with a subsequent trip to the free throw line, he knocks down 2 of 2, extending lead back to 8, but Diggs quickly up the other way, shows off the wheels, and a very positive play as he wraps that pass around the defender, and right back at it is our press. Hamilton takes it away, gives it to Schneiderman, who with some courageous effort gets the second chance points. 21-17 with a snap of a finger, we're right back in it. Tech subs in their starting front court as UTM still running with five reserve players. Now here is Cowens receiving the pass as he extends the lead back to six as he uses the baseline to his advantage. Cowens, one of the many great penetrators here on the Tech team. Schneiderman kicks it around to Diggs who continues to try to recreate the magic from this postseason run of his but he's just not had the same success today. And now here comes Luther Brooks, the backup point guard, feeding into Cordell Crosby who takes advantage of the mismatch this time. Just a couple of possessions ago was Peter Hamilton taking it on him man to man, but now Diggs finds himself on the wrong side of a mismatch. An easy two points for the 6'9 center. UTM backs against the wall in desperate need of a stop, down double figures with four and some chains left to go. Cowens rides the baseline, taking advantage of Renfro out of position, gives it up to Hoffman, off the mark, but Cowens scoops it up. He kicks it around to Hoffman once again. Fades away in double coverage, no good, but for the third time, they have a chance to shoot. Here comes Luther Brooks, who's sent back by Schneiderman, sent back again, but Brooks puts it in. Five chances for Tech to do some damage there, and Coach Carter calls timeout. He is incensed with his team. Just too many 50-50 balls that they've lost in this game so far, and easily right off the timeout as the starters check back in. A very ill-advised drive there. Clawson the other way. He pulls up with a foot on the line. Good defense from this defensive specialist Joey Ballard as he's actually running with the starters right now at the three. Saunders, he takes it all the way. Tickles the time with the layup, and we have to ride the hot hand right now. Saunders improves to 3 of 5 on the game here. Still down by 10 though, here comes Tyrese Clawson. Kicks it around to Bishop Walker who has his pocket picked. Easily coast to coast and he's going to need some better looks just like that one if he wants to get going. The 6'3 junior averaging 14 on the year. He finally breaks into the scoring column with his first basket on the runout. Approaching the two minute mark here in the first half, UTM trying to win these last two minutes as they go into the locker room as Ballard tips it away from Hoffman, he's been struggling today, but once again, Tech beating the UT Martin Skyhawks to all these loose balls, and now Clawson takes a baseline, but he's met with tough interior defense from Fry and Faye alike, 
and now setting up on offense on that same possession. Still down by 8, they feed it into Blaine Fry. He still is looking for his first basket and he uses the left handed post move. How about the little baby hook from Fry? He's not really much of a scorer. But he's still averaging a respectable 6.5 points per game on his freshman year. Now Saunders wanting to pick and roll with Faye. He uses the first one, doesn't get much separation. Faye sets another one, but Saunders with a really smart play as he finishes. 10 points for Marcus as he uses the spin move to go away from that second screen that Faye was setting. He fooled eyes again and had the separation he needed to shoot the rock. And now a 3 second difference between shot clock and game clock, UTM could have a big stop here but Clawson nails his second 3 of the night. And like I said that would have been a huge stop because UT Martin if they got a stop and a score it would have cut it to a 1 possession game but they still do get a score. Great job breaking the press, unselfish play there from Fry as he feeds Faye for his first basket as we head into the intermission 32-27, the Golden Eagles of Tennessee Tech lead. I think we have to be pretty satisfied and consider ourselves fortunate we're only down by 5. The way TTU started out on fire, they were slicing up our man defense and they were locking down on their own accord. As Jamarco Webster and the entire team, they were really good in rim protection and the rotations were crisp. Bishop Walker has been playing lights out, chipping in 9 points and lockdown D for Tennessee Tech. But once we started changing our personnel up a bit, we started finding more success and Tech started to cool down a bit. Saunders was terrific, 10 points, 4 of 6 from the floor, but it was too much of one man show to start. All of a sudden we got a basket here from Easley, a basket there from Faye, from Fry, and that really helped us chip away at the lead. Tech, however, really seemed to want it more than us, which is a trigger for Coach Carter. You guys already know he craves those 50-50 balls, and some more heart is going to be needed to sneak this one out. And we need to continue pressuring their drives. In the playoffs, UTM has been a second half team, so let's see if they can get it rolling and avoid another upset en route to a big second half and be Ohio Valley's representative in the March Madness this season for the first time in school history as Clawson comes out firing just like he did on Tennessee Tech's last possession in the first half, but he's unsuccessful there. And Faye immediately back the other way. Christopher Faye is going to have to get more involved. He's had a lights out postseason, 29 points in the round one game against the Red Hawks. That was his career high that night. And then a near double-double last time out against Moorhead State, only shooting 63% from the free throw line here in his sophomore year. But he steps up and knocks down 2 of 2, giving him 4 points total on the game. Chris Faye's matchup, Cordell Crosby, that was also his second personal foul, so that's something to keep in mind. As we head forward, and Faye goes right back at him on the next possession, slimming this back down to a one-possession game. Faye with his second field goal and points 5 and 6 for him on the night as Walker and Clawson will give and go action as he's fouled by Faye and now he picks up his second personal foul as well. Walker the lone senior here on the Tennessee Tech starting 5, a 6'2 senior from Mobile, Alabama shooting in the upper 80% from the charity stride missing the first one. Averaging 11 points, 3.5 rebounds, 2.5 assists, but he goes scoreless at the line in a risky outlet pass from Lawton, gets it through to easily, and there's the tie ball game where you're looking for. The crowd and the momentum starting to swing into UTM's favor as Fry scoops and scores there off the inbound. He's our team leader in steals per game this season. 1.6 a night for him as he does it again. Saunders picks it up and assists to Fry, rewarding him for the active hands. Right now we are enjoying a 13 to 1 run to begin the second half. And a big reason for that is our work inside the post as Faye becomes more acquainted with the offense today trying to go inside again which frees up easily 16 to 1 run for UTM and that's the 3 pointer we were looking for. This Golden Eagles defense has been so quick they've been lights out on the perimeter but we continue to pound it inside to begin the second half and finally that frees up somebody on the perimeter. Now switching to a 1-2-2 zone Tennessee Tech and that is a bad mistake there as Saunders is free to let it fly. A Baker's dozen as we extend the lead to double figures. All of a sudden we are in control and Lawton now has a chance to stroke it from 15 feet but he falls to 1 of 7 from the floor in this game after that miss. Coming back the other way, just trying to halt this momentum as Walker with the mismatch, he takes it on Chris Fay, who is not quick enough to keep up with him, and Walker has his average on the year eclipsed. He's averaging 10.5, he's got 11 in the ballgame. The Skyhawks still on a 16-5 run as they take over on offense, TTU still in this 1-2-2 zone. It's been creating a lot more easy looks for us as Saunders check him out, slipping behind the zone and finding one from the short corner. 
That baby J gives him 15 on the night. Now cutting to this play, Bishop Walker and Clausen almost turned over on the exchange. Their offenses look a lot more discombobulated here in the second half as now Walker tries a 30 footer way off the mark as it sails over the backboard and you could tell that their second half offense has been a lot more discombobulated than the first. 10 minutes left to go as Saunders continues to receive the green light taking this one baseline, a kiss off the window and Saunders has 17. In the first half it was all 2-3 zone or man from TTU but for some reason they favored this 1-2-2 zone defense and UTM has been exploiting it and they're still running it. Eight and a half left to go here in the championship game, up by six as Easy works it to Saunders and now he takes it on the right side, he just did it on the left, he shows he can do it on both, Saunders with 19, he's barely missed anything that he's thrown up. Now up by nine with seven minutes left to go, Easily surveying the court, looking for that high screen from Faye, he finally sets it. Easily is an open but Jock Diggs who shares the court with him right now, he flashes, fires and hits, a tough shot from Diggs. But another nice pass from Easley setting him up his third assist of the second half. And Easley was really struggling in the first half. But his playmaking has really opened up some opportunities for him here in the final 15 minutes. Coming out of the timeout, Coach Carter running with five bench guys as all the starters getting a bit of a break here with 555 left to go up by 11. And going back door is Isaac Yen. A beautiful assist from the savvy veteran point guard Bishop Walker, his fifth. And Yen. Second on the bench in points per game for the Golden Eagles at 7.5 behind Calvin Hoffman. And now the starters check back in with 5 and some change left to go. Up by 9. They got their little break as Easley tries to challenge Cordell Crosby and he is sent back. We haven't seen much of Crosby here in the second half and I'll explain why in a second as Hoffman with the pretty bounce pass feeds it into Yen for a second consecutive basket. But Faye's really given a lot of headache to Crosby inside, and Cordell's been playing with three fouls, which is why we haven't seen a lot of him here in the second half. A pick and roll between Saunders and Faye. He misfires, but Faye scoops it up. He goes right at Cordell Crosby again, tacking him with his fourth foul, and that is a colossal and one here down the stretch. Faye, with this free throw, can break his way into double digits for the third straight game, and he would knock it down. The Golden Eagles very pressed for time, but check out this screen as Isaac Yen fades to the corner. He strokes it for seven consecutive points for the junior forward from Sarasota, Florida. He is a spark plug, and he's showing why today. And these Golden Eagles are stingy. They're not going away without a fight as they force another stop. Cowan stopped on the baseline. This ball is worked around to Yen, who's hit seven consecutive points. Now to Clausen, who's already hit two threes in the game, but he's missed his three opportunities to shoot the three here in the second half. Faye collects rebound number eight as Lawton finds Saunders foot on the line. He rims it through. 21 points for the junior. 57-48, 320 left to go, we just need some stops, and Lawton, that's what we get, he tips the lazy pass from Walker, easy with the lob, Lawton finishes, let's go, Luke Lawton and Dwight Easley, they connect again like they did last episode for a lob, and Easley, once again, 4 assists here in the second half, his playmaking's been so fun to watch. Just looking for one more basket to put us over the mountaintop, 36 seconds left to go, one more shot. And that'll be too much for the Golden Eagles to handle. Come on, Easley. Take us home. Another brutal screen from Blaine Fry frees up Easley, who nails the three after it takes a high bounce off the front iron. Ten points for number ten, as Easley had all of those points in the second half. As he bleeds out the clock, and UT Martin is heading to the first March Madness in its school's history. When Coach Carter took this job three years ago, this was a team that was coming off a four win, 22 loss record. In year one, he wins 13 games, slips into the playoffs, wins a postseason game in an upset. Year two, we comfortably make the playoffs as a three seed, we get upset in the first round, but here in year three, it all comes together. Winning 20 plus games for the first time in Coach Carter's career, winning the most games in school history in a singular season, and for the first time, we are going dancing as a program. And it's all thanks to that man right there, Coach Carter, thanks to his charisma, his discipline, his pedigree, his order, everything, his caring of his players on and off the floor, 
and 23 episodes later, he's hoisting a trophy and going dancing with his loyal team. Another huge second half performance for these UT Martin Skyhawks has really been the name of the game for them here in the postseason. As Saunders led the way with 21, and Faye with 9 rebounds and 14 points. Speaking of rebounding, that was a big reason why we were able to pull this out, especially in the second half. 27 to 18, we out rebounded the Tennessee Tech Golden Eagles, the number one rebounding team in the conference, and we slotted them on the boards. Oh, finally, for the first time in school history, we're going to be watching selection Sunday, not to see if we're playing, but who we're playing. Let's go down to Clark Kellogg and Greg Gumble, who have the call. Get your popcorn ready, everybody. I'm excited. Welcome to 2K Sports Studios. I'm Greg Gumbel with Clark Kellogg. We're here with the 2K Sports NCAA Selection Show. We're all set to show you the seedings and pairings, so get out your bracket sheet, get those pencils ready. Here are the basics. Of the 65 available tournament bids, 31 are automatically given to conference champions. The tournament committee hands out the remaining 34 bids on an at-large basis. An opening round game will take place on Tuesday night to narrow the field to 64 teams. But before we unveil the brackets for this season, here's a look at the final top 25 media poll of the season. There are a couple of major changes in the rankings as March Madness approaches. There's a new team perched at the top of the poll. The Maryland Terrapins climbed to the number one spot after a terrific finish to their season. The USC Trojans were the number one team but slipped after spending two weeks at the top. There was also a big move made up the pole. The Duke Blue Devils jumped all the way from the number nine spot to number three. The NCAA Selection Committee has finished its meeting and we're ready to unveil the top four seeds in this year's tournament. The Maryland Terrapins are the top overall seed and they will play in the East Regional. They've just taken over the top spot in the media poll and they are the number one team in the eyes of the Selection Committee as well. We'll soon find out if they can live up to their billing. On to the second number one seed who will play in the South Regional, the USC Trojan are seeking their first ever NCAA championship. The South Carolina Gamecocks are our third number one seed, and they'll play in the Midwest Regional. They come roaring back into the tournament as a top seed after not even making the field for the past several years. Finally, our fourth number one seed will play in the West Regional. The Aggies of Texas A&M are in the tournament field as a number one seed for the first time in the history of their program. So with the number one seeds out of the way, it's finally time to tackle the rest of the brackets. First up, we take a look at the East Regional. The Maryland Terrapins are the top seed, finishing at 23 and 7. They were winners of the regular season championship in the ACC. They will take on the winner of the opening round play-in game between Drake with 13 wins and Delaware State from the MEAC. And now the number eight seed, the Dayton Flyers, come into the tournament on the strength of a third place finish in their conference regular season and were winners of their conference tournament. They're going to play the number nine seed, the Texas Tech Red Raiders, who were sixth in their conference, finishing at 21 and 10. Virginia Tech comes in as the number five seed, finishing at 22 and nine and they will take on the 12th seed from the Patriot League, the Lafayette Leopards, with 20 wins. Louisville enters the field as the number four seed from the Big East. It's yet another appearance in the brackets for a school that's no stranger to the NCAA tournament. They'll be getting ready to face the number 13 seed, the Middle Tennessee Blue Raiders. Finished the season with 19 wins. The Louisville Cardinals will be an extremely dangerous team in this tournament, mainly because they have such terrific veteran leadership. Coaches love when they have guys on the floor that have been around the block a few times because they don't get rattled. They play with composure. I look at the experience of this team as something that could put them over the top. The Texas Longhorns are in as the number six seed. They'll be taking on the number 11 seed, the Arizona Wildcats, with 21 wins. North Carolina comes in as the number three seed, finishing at 22 and 8. Fairleigh Dickinson comes in to face them at number 14 with 17 wins in the tournament championship of the Northeast Conference. Our number seven seed is from the ACC. The Wake Forest Demon Deacons were rewarded for their outstanding play this season with an at-large bid and a ticket to the big dance. They are going to play the, the St. Joseph's Hawks, who were sixth in their conference, finishing at 23 and 11. Next up is the number two seed. The Kansas Jayhawks are the regular season champion from the Big 12. They'll be going up against the number 15 seed, the UC Irvine Anteaters, with 17 wins. This will be their second appearance ever in the NCAA tournament. Next up, we'll take a look at the South Regional. 
the USC Trojan, are the top seed, finishing at 27 and 5. They were winners of the regular season championship in the Pac-10. They'll take on the Liberty Flames, the number 16 ranked team. This marks their fourth appearance in the NCAA tournament in school history. Vanderbilt comes in as the number eight seed, finishing at 19 and 13. Georgia comes in to face them at number nine with 18 wins and a legion of loyal fans just dying for some tournament success. Miami enters the field as the number five seed from the ACC. This will be their eighth appearance in the NCAA tournament in the history of their school. They'll be getting ready to face the number 12 seed, the tribe of William and Mary. Finish the season with 19 wins. The Miami Hurricane is a team to consider when you're filling out your bracket. They've been through so much this year. Adversity typically helps a team become a championship team. I wouldn't be surprised to see them put it all together over the next few weeks and become the focal point of this competition. Finishing at 22 and 8. And they'll take on the 13th seed from the Horizon League, the Flames of Illinois Chicago, with 18 wins. And now the number six seed, the Kentucky Wildcats, come into the tournament as the fourth place team in their conference during the regular season and finish second in their conference tournament. They are going to play the number 11 seed, the Xavier Musketeers, who finished second in their conference tournament, finishing at 21 and 14. The Connecticut Huskies are in as the number three seed. They'll be taking on the number 14 seed, the UNC Greensboro Spartans, with 17 wins. Next up is the number seven seed. The Wisconsin Badgers have established themselves as one of the best teams from the Big Ten. They'll be going up against the number 10 seed, the Southern Miss Golden Eagles, with 20 wins. This is their third appearance ever in the NCAA tournament. Our number two seed is from the Big Ten. The Michigan State Spartans had a tremendous year that included a regular season championship. They're going to play the number 15 seed, the Yale Bulldogs, who came in first in their conference tournament, finishing at 14 and 14. On to our third bracket of the day. Let's take a look at the Midwest Regional. The South Carolina Gamecocks are the top seed, finishing at 25 and 7. They were conference tournament champions in the SEC. They'll take on the Vermont Catamounts, the number 16 ranked team. This is their sixth appearance ever in the NCAA tournament. Our number eight seed is from the A-10 conference. But 49ers were rewarded for their outstanding play this season with an at-large bid and a ticket to the big dance. They're going to play the number nine seed, the Ohio State Buckeyes, who were semifinalists in their conference tournament, finishing at 21 and 12. The Boston College Eagle are in as the number five seed. They'll be taking on the number 12 seed, the California Golden Bear, with 18 wins. Alabama enters the field as the number four seed from the SEC. This will be their 20th appearance in the NCAA tournament in team history. They'll be getting ready to face the number 13 seed, Alabama A&M's Bulldogs. Finish the season with 25 wins. The Alabama Crimson Tide do the one thing that all great teams absolutely must do, and that's play tremendous team defense. These guys have been shutting down opponents all year with a combination of speed, intelligence, and sheer determination. There have been NCAA championship teams of all shapes and sizes, but all of them played good, strong defense. Tennessee comes in as the number six seed, finishing at 21 and 10. And they take on the 11th seed from the ACC, the Florida State Seminole, with 16 wins. And now the number three seed, the away team, come into the tournament after finishing second in their conference during the regular season and were semifinalists in their conference tournament. They are going to play the number 14 seed, the Montana Grizzlies, who came in first in their conference tournament, finishing at 19 and 12. Next up is the number seven seed. The UNLV Runnin' Rebels are the conference tournament champions from the Mountain West Conference. They'll be going up against the number 10 seed, the Oregon Ducks, with 22 wins. This will be their 11th appearance all time in the NCAA tournament. Duke comes in as the number two seed, finishing at 25 and 10. Toledo comes in to face them at number 15 with 16 wins in the tournament championship of the MAC. And finally, let's have a look at the West Regional. The Aggies of Texas A&M are the top seed, finishing at 25 and 8. They were conference tournament champions in the Big 12. They'll take on the Marist Red Foxes, the number 16 ranked team. This is their third appearance all time in the NCAA tournament. Next up is the number eight seed. The Minnesota Golden Gophers are the conference tournament champions from the Big Ten. They'll be going up against the number nine seed, the LaSalle Explorer, with 24 wins. This is their 12th appearance in the NCAA tournament in team history. Nevada comes in as the number five seed, finishing at 25 and six. 
and they will take on the 12th seed from the West Coast Conference, the Gonzaga Bulldogs, with 22 wins. Iowa State comes in as the number four seed, finishing at 25 and eight. South Dakota State comes in to face them at number 13 with 21 wins in the tournament and regular season championships of the conference. Our number six seed is from Conference USA. The Memphis Tigers are on a hot streak having just won their conference tournament championship. They are going to play the number 11 seed, the Tennessee Martin Skyhawks, who came in first in their conference, finishing at 24 and eight. The Michigan Wolverines are in as the number three seed. They'll be taking on the number 14 seed, the Lumberjacks of Stephen F. Austin, with 21 wins. And now the number seven seed, the Marshall Thundering Herd, come into the tournament first in their conference during the regular season and finish second in their conference tournament. They are going to play the number 10 seed, the Georgetown Hoyas, who were fifth in their conference, finishing at 19 and 12. Florida enters the field as the number two seed from the SEC. This marks their 16th appearance in the NCAA tournament in the history of their school. They'll be getting ready to face the number 15 seed, the Campbell Fighting Camel. Finish the season with 15 wins. The Florida Gators are going to provide serious matchup problems to any team that doesn't have depth and defensive ability at both guard spots. They have outstanding backcourt play at both ends of the court. It's the main reason they've made it this far, and they're going to have to maintain that form if they want to do some damage in this tournament. All right, Clark, now that we know all the teams and matchups, time to get the tournament underway and let the madness take over. Greg, let's throw the ball up right now. I can't wait to get started. I hope this is an NCAA tournament that gives a lot of those special moments that stay with us for years to come. Well, there you have it. UT Martin, the first time dancing in school history, they're rewarded with an 11 seed, going up against an interstate opponent, the Memphis Tigers, who finished 18th in the nation in the final poll. Next time we visit the Skyhawks, we'll be jumping into the first March Madness game in program history as we try to emulate the success that other 11 seeds have had in the recent years, like Loyola Chicago in 2017 and VCU in 2011 when they made the final four. If you guys have stuck around the entire time, many thanks to you. Have a good day, everybody. This is College Sports Revive, signing out.